I've discovered something. Students don't know how to read. Well, they know how to read. They just don't know how to read well. I love books! <laughs> book! 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 Harry, I don't think Patrick knows how to use a book properly. Or in the right way. Or the right way for the class and the books that are assigned in that class. Behold the books, Patrick. Each one has a story to tell. Look out! Those books are cliffhangers! Stories for the adventurous! Oh, oh, I'll save you! There are log books! Unabridged books! And books with bridges! There are a couple different kinds of readers, but there are a lot of different kinds of books. So let's take a look at the problem today that students just don't know how to read. Hi, I'm James Callahan, and this is The Do-Over Show. And with 20 plus years of experience in higher education as a professor, and with all those years of graduate school and all the thousands of books, there's a hard lesson to learn about what happens in college and university today, and that is reading is not very popular. Reading is becoming more and more difficult. Now, it's always been a problem, as one famous scholar said decades ago. Every generation at some point discovers that students cannot read well. Well, as well as they would like, or as well as the professors expect. Hello, Belle. Bonjour, Gaston. Gaston, may I have my book, please? How can you read this? There's no pictures. Now, there's a divide that's obvious in higher education between those who enjoy long-form reading like Lit and Humanities majors and those that tend to do more of the doing. That is, they use workbooks and they treat textbooks as instructional manuals. Do this step, do this step, do this step. Now go do those things. But with reading long-form or with reading creative work, there isn't that breakdown of obvious steps to do and so they become known as readers rather than doers and that's the problem because reading is an activity that we do we just don't know how to do it well one startling statistic to most won't surprise you if you've ever been in the classroom is that is less than 30 percent of higher education students even at elite universities less than 30 percent actually do the reading that they're assigned for their classes read the books the textbooks that they're assigned it's not a surprise if you've been in the classroom because one of the most obvious things is that students expect you to, well, do the reading for them, to do the work for them. And you know you're going to present the material regardless of whether they've read it or not. You may hold a contrived discussion about it, but all they're going to do is rely on the one or two people out of the class that actually did the reading. And those people are not going to learn more and the people who didn't read are just going to learn, well, the Cliff Notes version. Some blame this on TikTok or social media itself or a lack of focus or a new onset of ADD or they, all the reasons we can come up with about why we would say, why can't you sit for just 20 minutes and do one thing for 20 minutes? When's the last time you sat and did just one thing for 20 minutes without trying to do two or three or four things as well. Now, one of the more obvious complaints beyond TikTok and 60 second consumption cycles and the 20 minute problem that most psychologists tell us is completely possible if we just discipline ourselves. Discipline? What the heck is discipline? You see, you don't have to teach somebody who loves to read to sit there scrunched up in a chair reading hundreds of pages without stopping, losing track of time. But it's a painful experience to most when someone like a professor tells them you must read this and doesn't tell them how to read it. Now it could be that younger adults simply fill up their time with more things. When you were in school, if you're anything like me, you kind of treated it like a job and you spent 40 hours a week doing it and you actually studied and did the prep. What planet are you from? Nobody is from that planet anymore. So what we have to deal with is the reality. The reality is that students struggle with reading, assigned readings, even if they want to do well in the course, they still just don't engage at the level that most think, well, they can or should. Oh, one more complaint is that they come to college without the preparation that they need. That is through K through 12, they're not given entire books to read anymore. High school with an entire book that you would read and discuss over several weeks of time. So that when you get into college and you expect them to read a book a week, they look at you like you are asking the impossible. 
and for most it is impossible. So how do students read today if they do try to read? Well, most of them skim. That is, they don't read a book from cover to cover. They read it for a purpose, for part of it. Others may use AI to come up with a summary. Still others, sort of like a Cliff Notes or Spark Notes version of it, others will simply look at the description of the book. And if they're smart, they'll actually look at a review of a book. But even that takes a little bit extra effort. And only the sharpest non-readers among your reading group are going to pull those things. And one of the biggest things that students do these days is to read for the test. That is, they read for the kind of questions or answers to questions that you will provide them on a test. So they go to school on your first test or quiz and they figure, oh, that prof likes to ask that kind of question. And then their reading becomes a default to that mode where they're going to read for the test. And they're going to read for preparation for the test. Now, to those who assign textbooks, we say, well, you're supposed to get much more than that. I'm only testing you on a small part of it. But that's not what they're doing. That's not how they're proceeding. And we've actually encouraged them when we give tests on reading like that, and we give them answers from selections of the reading, they were actually teaching them, reinforcing this habit, bad habit, this habit of reading for the test. Hmm. Now, if you're one of those who wants to be a better reader, you're sitting in a class, one of the easiest ways is to ask the prof, hey, what are you looking for from this? What are you asking me to do? If they give you some esoteric answer, like I want you to experience the book or something, know that they're full of, I won't say it, but know that you're gonna have to do a little extra work to figure it out. That is, ask other people who have taken the course, that's an easy way to do it. Somebody else has taken that course. Most professors don't change textbooks every single semester. Find somebody, upper class, that has actually taken the course, read the book, go with that. Now, another way of dealing with the problem of how do I become a better reader is a little exercise that I practice, and that is learn just by reading things like short stories, short stories that usually follow a pattern. You see, once you can recognize a pattern in what you're reading, that there's a, actually a plot happening, and it's not just character development, but there's actually a simple structure it's from the ancient world. Some people credit it to Aristotle and poetics, yes, but there are newer versions of this, and it follows an acronym, A-B-D-C-E. That is, the, there's a structure that you can follow. A is for action, the thing that happens. Then you go into background, that's B, and then there's a development of the characters and the circumstances, and then there's a climax, and then there's an ending or a closure to it, sometimes ironic. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Or I could have seen that coming, or there was foreshadowing there. That is, as soon as you learn to see a pattern in what you're reading, you're no longer an outsider trying to fight your way in, but now you feel like you're actually an insider to what is being read. You feel like one of the cool kids. That This is simply like asking a professor when they assign a book, find out why that book was written. Because when you find out why the 1,000th book on the Salem Witch Trials was assigned to you for a course, why did somebody think you needed a 1,000th book when there are 999 perfectly good books on the subject? Because every book is published for a purpose. No publisher, no even self-publisher is going to say, I'm just going to put another one out there because I don't say anything new. They all think they're saying something new. Find out what that is. When you find out what that is, you'll probably discover why the professor assigned the book. And you'll actually be able to look for that in the book and you'll be able to focus on the things that the author is focusing on. Again, you become an insider to what you're reading. Okay, now if you're on my side of the lectern and you're looking at your classroom full of students and they just do not do the reading, you can punish them and give them quizzes and make sure their grade suffers for it so they learn this adverse reinforcement lesson. It's not my favorite, but a lot of colleagues do it, and they view teaching as adversarial. That is, you're the one who knows it all, and you're trying to get the students at least to engage on the level that you did. But let's face it, you've read thousands of books, thousands of books to get where you are. They are not going to become you, nor do you need to treat them as though they are you, or as good as you. Instead, first of all, do not assume that they will do the reading. Admit defeat right up front. And then from there, go with that. That's, tell them, I know you're going to struggle to do the reading. You probably won't do the reading. Actually, I tell them a story that actually indicates some vulnerability. And that is, when I was an undergrad, I took a course and I received a D- minus in the class. I received a D- minus only because the professor promised that we showed up every day, if we did the reading, we took all the quizzes and tests, and we did the final paper, that we would not fail the course. I struggled with this course and multiple textbooks. I just couldn't handle it. 
It didn't help that the professor was probably the worst teacher I have ever experienced in higher education. I got a D minus with a 3.95 GPA on a 4.0 scale. So what happened? Well, that subject of that class became the thing that I studied for my master's degree and my PhD. What turned it around? Well, some of it was I just got pissed. I was just upset. I said, you know what? I can learn this stuff. And it bothered me to get a D minus when I was actually doing really, really well as an undergrad. And that was sort of a chip on the shoulder. So you need to develop a chip on the shoulder, shoulder of your student. Get them something that get, gets them motivated. The second thing is, and I've mentioned this already, and that is avoid punishing them. Avoid treating it like a game as though it's adversarial. Though I've read everything and you've read so little, can't you even read a little bit? Just get over yourself already and avoid punishing. Instead, find ways to reward people who actually do the reading. And one of the ways of actually encouraging this is that I tell them what I'm looking for. When I assign something, I said, look, you got 50 pages to read for next Tuesday. You're going to encounter these three subjects. Pay attention to this. Look for this person's name. See what happened to them. And then let them play out. At least if I give them this guided reading tool. Yes, it's a little extra work. I've already read the book. I may have written the book. I'm going to give them things that they can look for. Again, it makes them feel like insiders to the textbook. Not so much of an obstacle and not so much of an adversarial game. Another thing I do is that I ask them to write discussion questions from what they're reading. That is, after I give them the guided reading, then I give them the challenge. I said, I want you to come up with two discussion questions and I'm going to look for them in the next class. That is, as they're reading, figure out, well, maybe we should talk about this or that. They can be as vague or as simple as they want. As long as they develop a question about the content of what we are assigned to read for the next class, when we get to the next class, we have a conversation about those questions. We actually talk about what are good questions and what are not as good questions. Lesser questions, bad questions, Questions that we're going to avoid, but actually talk about, okay, why would, what can you do with that question? Can you make it a little bit more tied to the reading, less generic? Tell me something about, not how does it make you feel, but why did saying that about John in this circumstance, what were the outcomes? What were the alternatives? And how did John feel? Or how would you feel if you were John? See, just get them deeper into it and have a conversation and then you help them as they read and you break down the walls or the barriers that they feel like they're an outsider to. I also encourage them to use AI, to use descriptions, to use reviews, to use anything they can to give them a 30,000 foot view of the text itself or a summary. Yes, I embrace AI. I give them a wiki challenge. I ask them to use Wikipedia and look up one person, one place, one event, one subject, one theme from the reading that we have for each class. And then I give them an opportunity to share it. Sometimes it's just wacky stuff. They looked up something about some odd little detail. Great. They looked up something. They engaged in something and they used a tool that every single one of them uses, Wikipedia, to figure out what it is that they're actually trying to read. It's another level of engagement and it works. And this brings me back to the reinforcement, the positive reinforcement, rather than punishing them. And that is, I always celebrate reading when it happens. Let me tell you a story. Early in my career, I had assigned something. It was a great college, and it was tough to get into, and there was a rigorous level of expectations assigned to even basic courses, gen ed courses. I was teaching one of those, and it became apparent after a few minutes of me trying to get a discussion going that nobody in this class of 40 people had even come close to trying to do the reading. So I was upset. I closed the book, I slammed it, and I said, why bother even doing this stuff if you're not gonna do the reading? And I stormed out of the class. I made a real scene of it. A couple people went, found me afterwards. I'm sorry, I really should have done the reading, but my mother was sick, or my dog ate my homework, or whatever it is, they said. So instead, instead of punishing them, I look for positive ways to do reinforcement in class. That is, certain people will always do the reading. You can congratulate them, but everybody looks at them and says, well, look who's teacher's pet. Instead, find ways of engaging them at a lower level than those people who just sit down and read books from cover to cover like you do, like I'm used to doing. By the way, let me admit something. When I was doing research for my dissertation, for example, reading thousands of books, I don't think I read all those books. In fact, I used the books. That is, I didn't sit down and read a textbook from cover to cover or a collection of essays from cover to cover. Instead, I looked for what I was looking for, found it, used it. And I didn't think I needed to read everything from cover to cover. That's not the kind of reading that made me successful as a researcher. 
You know this, don't you? That as you use books, instead of being used by a book, yes, a nice novel where you can sit down and it can take you and lead you in new directions for exploration, that's fine if you've got time to kill. But if you've got a job, a task, clubs, activities, whatever it is you've got, a family, responsibilities, you may work for a living as a student or as a teacher, and you find out, I've got to learn to use books rather than simply being taken on journeys, fantasy trips by books. Realize the reality of how a book can be used to your advantage. Figure out why it's there. Figure out what you can do with it and get a level of engagement that actually gets them started. If something catches, if they get excited, great. If not, then at least they've done more than not do the reading. Hey, and thanks for being part of the Do Over Show. Please, while you're here, could you tap the like button because it really helps. And while you're down there, how about you subscribe and ring the notifications bell so you don't miss the next episode. I'm so glad you found me and I found you. Thanks. <laughs>